everyone, my name's Jamie Taylor and welcome to A Guide to Practical Comping Part 2. Now if you're listening to this, that's either because you've already completed Part 1 or you've decided to start the course halfway through. Now that's absolutely fine, but I will just start with a little overview of what was covered in that first video because I'm going to be assuming in this class that you've internalised some of that material. Essentially the first lesson dealt with basic drop two and drop three voicings for all the essential chord types, major seventh, minor seventh, dominant seventh, half diminished and so on. All the different inversions of that over the fretboard and how to voice lead through them. And we also looked at what I call shell chords, which is really trying to play those sounds using the most economical means possible. Typically that was a root note and then a third and a seventh and just manipulating that skeleton shape to make everything that we need. And then there were one or two technical tips as well. Now if you're not sure whether or not you need to look at that, there is a great description on Mike's site and obviously there's a trailer there as well. Or well, feel free to contact me, I'm very happy to clarify for you what was in that first class so that you can make an informed decision about whether or not you need it. But certainly as we go on into part two, I'm going to be assuming that if you need a, a chord shape for E half diminished, in a particular area of the neck that you can find one. So you really will need to have those basic chord voicings together. Now what you heard there was a little bit of polka dots and moonbeams laid out using what we call quartal voicings. Quartal voicings, essentially what that means is that the chords are constructed using intervals of a fourth. They're not all necessarily perfect fourths, we can include augmented and even diminished fourths. There is technically such a thing as a diminished fourth, it's the same thing as a major third. So if you were to take a voicing like this one, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with already, you might know this is the top end of a G13 with the F, B, E and A. That is in fact a quartal voicing because we have an augmented fourth here in the middle, then we have a perfect fourth between the second and third strings and we have a perfect fourth again on the top. And that's called a quartal voicing. Now, then we might end up calling that a D minor chord of some kind. It would be a D minor six nine actually. If we were to relate it to the F, That has a major 7 sharp 11 flavour to it, a Lydian sound. It really doesn't matter, it's actually not important at all uh, for the next few minutes to really worry about what these things are as chordal entities in their own right because rather what we tend to use quartal voicings for and as I was just doing earlier there with the standard is to sort of create a mood, create a, a scale sound, the individual component parts of it are less important than the overall palette that we're working with. Something that's quite useful to add in to all of that is a few more G13 shapes, rootless thirteenths. If you remember it all started from here. But that's not the only way that we can play a G13, a rootless G13 on the top few strings. Here's a good one. So that has a couple of open strings at the top there. I've got F, A, B and E. These are all on the PDF. And that's the first one again. The next one up, similar sound but different configuration of notes and fingers. Still got the same 
perfect fourth on top as that one had. And then coming a little bit further up the guitar we have this one, which is effectively this one on the inner four, but then just barred to include the D. natural seven up at the top and then here it's going to have a ninth up at the top relative to a D so they all work very well as that what else can we find in a melodic minor scale well there's an altered chord in there the uh, the seventh degree the seventh mode of the melodic minor is often referred to as the altered scale and you've probably encountered the idea especially if you're a little bit more advanced you're probably used to the idea of playing melodic minor upper semitone on altered dominance the idea that uh, d melodic minor might be something that you could play over a c sharp altered now funnily enough if we take one of those uh one of those 13 shapes that i've just shown you this one up here Now I've, I've taught you that as being a G13 sharp 11. And then I pointed out that it might also be a D minor major 9. Now if I hear that over, instead of the D, over the C sharp, I'm sure you can hear that that's an altered dominant. It's actually a dominant 7th sharp 9. And although that particular shape might not be familiar to you, I'm sure if we were to take this and port it across onto the inner four strings, I'm sure you've played that one before, most of you. Dominant seventh sharp nine, like the first chord of Jimi Hendrix's Purple Haze. So it's actually a quartal voicing that, uh, which I, I certainly had played that chord many times before it occurred to me that it's actually something that we can come across in a in a quartal harmonized melodic minor scale. Perhaps that's familiar to some of you. The chord changes are two measures each of D minor seven, B flat seven sharp eleven, E half diminished, A seven altered, and back to D minor. So you have this. actually use those same four chords speeded up to make a little turnaround as I did just there. It's also the same changes that John Coltrane used in the second section of his Love Supreme suite. Uh, that part. Da, 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 da. So chances are you're familiar with uh, one or other of those. We hear a lot said about comping being supportive and interactive. But what I would emphasise is that comping really should be no different to a solo line in that it should make musical sense on its own terms. When we're playing a single line solo, we're trying to tell a story, we're trying to have a narrative, and we're trying to play something that makes sense musically and has some feeling of resolution to it. And that's no different with comping. We want to try and make things resolve and to work on their own terms. And if we do that, then the chances are that what we're playing will work very well behind the solo, even if it's taking a slightly different route through the changes, as long as what you're doing makes sense 
on its own terms. Thank you.